Well, if you have your Bibles, would you open to the book of Genesis? Genesis chapter 39 this morning. As we continue in our study, looking at sermons on the life of Joseph. Joseph, what an intriguing Bible character. What an amazing Bible character. What an example for us to look and to emulate Joseph and his walk with God. We've been preaching a series of messages, or I've been preaching a series of messages, not we, I have been, and you've been listening. And I've labeled them, entitled them, in spite of. Sometimes, when I don't know about you, when I read the Bible, I can, if I'm not careful, think, well, that was great for this guy, that was great for this lady, that was amazing for them, but will it happen to me? Boy, they don't look like they ever had any problems in their life. Or their problems were small when compared to my problems. Have you ever felt that way, that your problems are bigger sometimes than problems in the Bible? Or am I the only one? In spite of problems, this morning, we'll look at it in Genesis chapter 39, in the beginning of chapter 40, where Joseph was still faithful, even on the roller coaster of life. Joseph was still faithful, even on the roller coaster of life. Does life ever seem like a roller coaster to you? I remember the first time that I went on a roller coaster. I was in the 10th grade and my friend came and said, JD, it's my birthday and I get to take one friend to Cedar Point and I want you to go with me. I had never been to Cedar Point before. Now those of you who don't know, Cedar Point is, is an amazing or to some people an amazing theme park full of roller coasters. By some estimations, the number one roller coaster theme park in the world, but they battled out with a couple other roller coaster theme parks. Went to, to uh, I, I went there with my friend, and he said, okay, JD, we're going to start small. We're going to go to the big ones. We're going to start in this little one. Its name was the Iron Dragon. It's no longer in existence. It's gone. I got an Iron Dragon. It's just a little click, 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 click. After the click comes the whoosh, right? How many have ridden a roller coaster before? You know what I'm talking about. Click, 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 click. They slow down, don't they? Click, whoosh. It was a good whoosh. Iron Dragon, it was a very small, tame ride. Bagging around, first one I ever rode, Iron Dragon. Boy, had a good time on that. What do you want to do? Ride it again is fine because that other ones are big. All right, this is not so big. We continued on that day riding as many as we could until, until I got on one that was called the Mean Streak. Mean Streak was at one point the largest wooden roller coaster in the world. It's no longer the largest wooden if I'm not mistaken, but it's still a very large, it was a very large wooden roller coaster. Very fast wooden roller coaster. Very shaky wooden roller coaster. It was on the mean streak that I learned something about me. I did not know this before. You see, I don't get sick when I ride in a car. I don't get sick when I ride on a boat. I don't get sick when I fly on an airplane. But I get sick on roller coasters. Here I was on the mean streak, and I had ridden the Iron Dragon, ridden the Magnum, ridden a few other ones as well that were there. Came to the mean streak, and my friend Jason said, this is a great one. I love the mean streak. And okay, this is great. I was feeling a little bit queasy before, but I got on this thing, and as we came around the last bend, I knew it was not going to be a good ending. There was a young man and a young lady in front of us, in the car in front of us. It was an even worse ending for them. Because I lost my cookies right then. Came around that last, and right at the end, we came around that last turn, and we were going to go straight right back into the, the little place where you get off. And as the roller coaster stopped and slowed way down, my stomach didn't stop and slow way down. It was going a mile a minute. And I did the only thing that a person the right man can do. I let it all loose. It was all out there. And the young lady in front of me reaped the consequences of that. What did you do next, Pastor? Got off that roller coaster and hid myself in the theme park, <laughs> hoping never to be found by that couple again. I have since ridden roller coasters. I've taken Dramamine. They said, well, that, that'll solve all life's problems. Take some Dramamine, you can ride them all day. Dramamine merely delays the inevitable. 
I can ride a few more. I usually now can ride one or two and then I know when I'm time to be done and that it's done. Do you know that for me, uh, Gatorade and roller coasters don't mix? Red Gatorade doesn't mix with roller coasters. Neither do hot dogs or pretzels and cheese. Now, came as a youth pastor and kids are like, we want to go to Cedar Point, pastor. That sounds tremendous. Go ride all of them you want to ride. I'm not afraid of them. They don't scare me. They just make me sick. You know, sometimes life feels like a roller coaster. Sometimes we're heading up and, boy, it's the greatest thing ever, that thrill. And that thrill coming down that first slope, boy, everything was still good then for me. Life can feel like a roller coaster. Understand that at times things go up and things go down. At times things seem to be going well and then the next moment it seems like the bottom's just dropped out. You ever felt that way in life before? Up and down, back and forth. There is a ride at Cedar Point that if I had to, this claim was my favorite roller coaster ride, it'd be that one at Cedar Point called the Raptor. For whatever reason, I know I've never gotten sick on the Raptor. And I've enjoyed the Raptor every time I've ridden it, which is about four or five times now. I don't need to ride again now and see if it's still my favorite. It'll be my favorite in my mind. But in the Raptor, it does some crazy things. It goes up and down. You're hanging there. It throws you left and throws you right. And you come vertical with the ground. And, and really, if this thing fails, I'm in a heap of trouble. Life can feel like a roller coaster. Life can go up and life can go down, life can go back and life can go right and life can go left. If we're not careful, we will get distracted, we will get discouraged when life feels like a roller coaster. Sometimes the mountains look steep and the, then the hills seem hard to climb. Sometimes the valley looks deep. Sometimes it looks like we can never get out of this. But we know the truth that God can work all things together for good. We may not be able to see around the next obstacle, but God is still good. Some people on a roller coaster want to ride in the front car. In the front car, you hang over the edge for just a moment before the bottom drops out. You say, why would they want to do that? I don't know. Maybe when the Lord handed out brains, he missed a couple, perhaps. No, I just, I jest. I want to look this morning in Genesis chapter 39, and I want to look and point out a few things about the roller coaster of Joseph's life. Because if we're not careful, we will miss the fact that Joseph experienced the roller coaster of life. I believe it makes the ending to Joseph's life that much more powerful. The faithfulness of Joseph that much more compelling and challenging. Look in, Joseph, in Genesis chapter 39, if you would, in verse 20 to 23, where the Bible says, And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Lord, I thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you for this passage of Scripture. Lord, I would ask and pray you'd help us. Lord, I don't know what issues and problems folks might be facing today, Lord, but we know that you're in control. Lord, we know that you're faithful. You're a good God. Lord, I pray we'd see from the life of Joseph that we can remain faithful to you even when we feel like we're on a roller coaster of life. Lord, bless this time. Now help me as I speak to communicate those truths that would be right and evident, Lord. Let me to say those things that would be helpful and true to you. Lord, I pray that there's someone here who's not saved, doesn't know you as their Savior, never trusted you, that today they would turn to you. Lord, we love you. We'll give you the praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis chapter 39, we looked at it last week, and the story in Potiphar's house. I want to kind of recap and surmise what's happening here, but I, first of all, I see the turmoil in Joseph's life. You see, up until this point, life has been full of turmoil for Joseph. 
After he's born, a few years later, his mom passes turmoil for Joseph. Because of that, his father shows him some greater affection than he does for the rest of the, of the other brothers and the sister Dinah. And so there's turmoil because of some, some love that's not fairly balanced in the family. And his father makes him a coat of many colors. There's turmoil. His brothers, the Bible says, will not even speak peaceably to him because of his father's affection. What did Joseph do to earn it? Nothing. Joseph had done nothing. He was just there. And there's turmoil in Joseph's life. Joseph, throughout the time, then followed his father. And his father sent him on a mission. A mission to report on his brothers. Tell us your well-being. Now, kids do this naturally, don't they? My kids report back to me naturally what the other ones are doing if somehow what they think is doing is not what I want. Dad, James. Mom, Danielle. Dad, Johnny. We call it tattletaling, don't we? Kids naturally do this. I have never, that I can think of, told my kids, listen, go check on your brothers and report back to me. Let me know how they're doing. Right? It's my job as a parent. But, but Joseph, Joseph's father sent him to find out how they're doing, the state of affairs there. And as he was going to find them, they said, here comes the dreamer. And they ended up selling him to Egypt. And he got to Egypt. That picks us up to Genesis chapter 39. In Genesis 39, I see the installation of Joseph. He sold to Potiphar, verse number 1. Then we see in verses 2 and 3, the exaltation of Joseph. He's, he's promoted in Potiphar's household. Nothing is done without the hand of Joseph being a part of it. The, the, Potiphar saw that God was with him. And listen, my friend, if God is with you, other people will see it. To see God's hand prospering. Potiphar saw that God was prospering Joseph. So much so that Potiphar's house was blessed. The exaltation of Joseph. I wonder if at this point in the story, if maybe Joseph felt like finally he'd caught a little bit of a break. It'd been kind of rough up until this point. But now that he's there, it's a, making the best of the worst circumstances it seems like. And now, maybe he felt a little bit vindicated. Maybe he felt like, well, you know what? I remain faithful and, and God is honoring my faithfulness. Lord, you've now promoted me even though I maybe didn't choose to be in Egypt and I maybe didn't want to go to Egypt. You sent me here and now there's a little bit of exaltation. And right about that time, right about that time after the exaltation of Joseph, we see the temptation of Joseph. Oh, Potiphar's wife fixed her eye on Joseph. She began to tempt him and said, Joseph, come here. He refused. Look in Genesis 39, verse 9, where Joseph says, There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You see, Joseph still in Egypt, still under temptation, when no one else would have known, Joseph said, you know what? I can't sin against God. Listen, strength and temptation is strength for God. Strength in God. You want to resist temptation? Then base it upon your strength in God Almighty. And Joseph said, how can I do this against God? And, and Joseph refused the temptation. He took the right stand. He did what was right. There was nothing wrong found in, during this time. Joseph didn't take a misstep. Joseph didn't take a wrong approach. Joseph did just right. Then in verse number 13, we see the accusation of Joseph. Joseph was doing just right, but all of a sudden, when Potiphar's wife was rejected, she began to accuse Joseph, and as Potiphar came home in verse number 13, she, uh, she said that she began to yell, and, and she called, first of all, the men of her house in verse 14, and seeing, see this, he had brought in a Hebrew to mock us, and he came in to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice, completely and utterly fabricated. We know that because God told us that, didn't he? All right, completely fabricated. She made up a story. Potiphar comes home. She repeats the same scenario fabricated and Potiphar throws Joseph into prison not only do I see the exaltation the temptation the accusation I see the incarceration of Joseph Potiphar says you know what that's it you're going to prison now 
people have argued for a while if Potiphar believed his wife or not. They've argued, well, if he had really believed her, he would have had him killed. I don't know if he believed her or not. And quite frankly, it doesn't particularly matter because Joseph still ended up in prison. All right, up and down, up and down under false accusation. Have you ever been accused of something falsely? A few years back, I was driving a bus for the school, for our school. So we ran a bus. Came across the railroad tracks, right across Dixie Highway, and all of a sudden a nice vehicle uh, with a little light on top turned it on. Pulled over the bus. I've driven a bus since and before, and it takes a lot for someone to pull over a bus. So I'm thinking, boy, was I really speeding by doing something. I just crossed the railroad tracks, but I had stopped there, and I had turned on my lights. I'd opened the door, looked both ways. I think I got out and walked on the railroad tracks back and forth, right? No, I hadn't done that. And I pulled over, and sure enough, this, this uh, police officer came and, and said, Well, what are you doing? Driving the bus. Brother Carlos was on the bus that day. She began to say, Well, you weren't wearing a seatbelt. And before the Lord, I had my seatbelt on the whole day. The whole time. No, you didn't have it on there. You just put it on. False accusation. False accusation. Boy, that'll rile you, won't it? You don't know. Get a camera. Put me on a lie detector test, you know. I don't torture me. Waterboard me. I had my seatbelt on. Man, a false accusation. Something like that to kind of rile us. Say no. Now, listen, I've been guilty of many things in my life like you have. I've been pulled over for speeding. How fast were you going? Way too fast. <laughs> Way too fast. Another time I was speeding down Dixie Highway. Saturday morning, I was coming back from the church. Please ever pull me over. Do you know how fast you're going? No, sir, I do not. I was praying. And I was. I was praying and driving. Can you do two things at once? Nope, apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not. I was guilty. He said I was going, what, 63 or 64 down Dixie Highway? I guess the king's business requires haste, right? And so praying for the Lord. But a false accusation. It'll happen sometimes in a school setting. Teachers backs to the board, right? Two kids are talking. Hey, you and you, stop talking. I wasn't talking. Was it me? Was it me? Now, every other day of the year when the teacher turns around, you're talking. But not that time. False accusations. You, it'll happen, it'll happen sometimes in a marriage relationship. Honey, how did you lose my keys? I didn't touch your keys. Well, you had you because they're not where I put them. False accusations. Boy, false accusations can just rile us up, can they not? Can I help you this morning? If you're ever worried about a false accusation, just look to the life of Jesus. He dealt with some false accusations. They called Jesus a blasphemer. He wasn't and he isn't. He's the son of God. When he claimed to be God, he is God. He was God then. He is God now. He never blasphemed a single time. They called Jesus a drunkard. He wasn't and he isn't. They called him illegitimate. They filled, up, they filled up a court with accusations, though they couldn't agree with each other. False accusations. And the Bible says that Jesus opened not his mouth. Wow. What if we tried that? But, but, but you don't understand. They said that I did this. It wasn't me. False accusations. Joseph is in prison because on the outside, there was a false, fabricated, fooling accusation. And whether it was fully believed or not, did not change the fact that Joseph was locked up again in prison. Can you not see the roller coaster? Born, mom dies. Loved by his dad, hated by his brothers. Sold, even deeper, into Egypt. Gets a little bit up on, on promoted in, in Potiphar's house. False, false accusation back down into prison. Up and down, up and down, up and down. What do we do? When life seems like it's on a roller coaster ride, sometimes it comes from work. 
where the boss is this way one day and this way the next day. Don't say amen, Pastor Cowling. <laughs> Roller coaster. Roller coaster. Sometimes it can be at school. It can be among coworkers. Sometimes it's at home. But it's up and down. Sometimes it's with our health. Sometimes it's with our finances. Sometimes it's with our responsibilities. Things are up and down, left and right, back and forth. And I see with Joseph, I see a roller coaster ride. Now, if we're not careful, we look at the end, we're like, yeah, but Joseph, but Joseph, you're going to be second in command. But he didn't know that. But he didn't know that. You see, I see the turmoil in Joseph's life. But I recognize that there's temptations in our life when this happens. There's temptations in our life. There's tempt we're tempted to question. Tempted to question, God, why would you bring me here? God, why would you make this happen again? Why, Lord, why would you do this? Why would you cause me to prosper just to fail again? Can't I ever catch a break? What's the old adage? When it rains, it pours. You know what that is? Why can't I catch a break? If one tire goes, all four tires go. If one spot leaks, the whole roof caves in. If the tree falls down, it's going to crush the house. Right? If you hit a deer, it's going to hit your truck, of course. Tempted to question, why would God bring me here? Why would God cause me to bring me up just to bring me back down? Lord, why would you put me on this stupid roller coaster? Somehow we think in our life that life should always just go up, don't we? That's why we get discouraged. We think life should always just climb, climb, click, 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 click. We should never have that dip in there. When it happens, that's when like, Lord, why would you bring up that hill? I'd rather stay in the station. I'd rather stay at home. But, but God is doing something here. We're tempted to question. We're tempted to quit. Can you imagine if Joseph had quit at this point? What if Joseph had said, you know what? That's it, Potiphar. I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. Potiphar, I'm going to tell you exactly what I think about you and your wife. I'm going to tell you exactly what I think about the way you're running your house. I'm going to tell you exactly what I think about this country. He didn't do that, though, did he? Tempted to quit. Tempted to say, you know what? I'm done. I've had it. It's not worth serving God. It's not worth uh, living, trying to live a life that pleases God. It's not worth doing these things. We're also tempted to disregard. We're tempted to disregard the hand of God. To disregard the blessings of God. Don't forget the kind of the theme verse for this this whole series of messages in Genesis chapter 50 where Joseph said, you meant it for evil, ye meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Throughout this whole time, Joseph looks for the blessing and the hand of God. You see, God was still at work. God was still giving to Joseph. At every stage, I see that God is prospering Joseph. He has the Midas touch. If it's in Potiphar's house, Midas touch. In prison, the Midas touch. When he eventually goes to Pharaoh and, and is in Egypt, he has the Midas touch. Everything he touches turns to gold. You see, God was doing something that Joseph couldn't see. We could say it this way. Joseph, you're in the wrong place. I need you in Egypt. But God didn't tell Joseph that. He just got him to Egypt. And God doesn't owe you or me an explanation, does He? We, we, we think that if God tells us what His plans is, then it will be okay. Well, Joseph, here's what's going to happen today. Joseph, you're going to get sold and you're going to go to Egypt. You're going to go to Potiphar. You'll be accused falsely, then to prison. Oh, okay. You know what we'd do? We would pick and choose. We'd say, Lord, that sounds good, second command. I think we're going to just take out the part where I go to jail. I don't like that part. And Lord, I'd rather not be tossed in a pit. Could it be something a little softer than that? Perhaps maybe, a, uh, perhaps maybe a, a bunch of cotton candy. Can we do that instead? Lord, I don't want that particular struggle. I don't want that. Joseph, you're in the wrong place. I need you in Egypt. Maybe God today is saying, my friend, you're in the wrong place. I need you somewhere else. Joseph, you're in the wrong position. I need you in prison. I need you in prison, Joseph, because I can bring you up out of prison. In prison, you're going to be in the place that I can get you. Joseph, you're in, you're in the wrong 
you're in the wrong position. You're second in command right now in Potiphar's house, but you need to go to jail, Joseph. And Joseph, you don't know the right people. I have a butler that you need to meet. And if Joseph had never gone to prison, he never would have met the butler. You see, God's hand was still at work while the roller coaster of life was going on. God is still working. So let me give you three thoughts. Thoughts for our life when life feels like a roller coaster. Thoughts from what I see from Joseph that he did. Three easy phrases. First one is this one stay on. Stay on. Stay on the ride. Stay on the ride. I'm in the middle of the mean streak and my stomach starts to turn. The last thing I need to do is jump off that ride. But that's what I feel like doing. That's what I feel like doing. I gotta get off this thing right now. You know what can happen when people are on the roller coaster ride of life? They jump off mid ride. They jump off mid ride. Joseph stayed on. He kept on riding. He kept on going on to the next task, on to the next obligation. In his father's house, he did the father's things. In Potiphar's house, he did Potiphar's things. In prison, he did prison things. When he goes to Pharaoh, he'll do Pharaoh things. At every step of the way, Joseph did what he was supposed to do. Stay on the ride. Do what God has called you to do. Be who God has called you to be. Don't jump ship. Don't get off the wagon. Boy, I've seen countless people. When life takes a downward turn, a left or right, they quit church. They quit church. Life was better before church was in my life. They quit on church. They quit on God. They quit on their families. They quit on the ministry. I know of people who have been pastoring churches in a ministry. And when life got difficult, when the roller coaster took a dive down to the valley, it seemed, they said, oh, there's my exit. I'm out of here. Someone said this, most people give up just when they're about to achieve success. They quit on the one yard line. They give up the last minute of the game, one foot from a winning touchdown. I can encourage you, my friend, when life seems like a roller coaster, stay on. Hebrews 13, 5 says this, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I read a story about this particular verse. In the Greek, all right, not to bore you with Greek, in the Greek, you can use double negatives. Now, in English, you can't use double negatives, all right? They cancel each other out, but in Greek, you can. In this particular verse, there's three of them. He will never, ever, ever, ever leave us nor forsake us. Basically, God will, ever be, will always be there. But I read a story about a, a college student who was talking to an elderly lady. And explaining this to her. And he said, boy, Hebrews 13, 5, boy, it's powerful. Three times God says this. Isn't that great? And she goes, Sonny, that's what's wrong with you Greek people. You have to hear it three times. God told me one time and I got it. <laughs> a lot of truth right there. Nobody tell you a lot of truth right there. I tell you, my friends, stay on because God will never leave thee nor forsake thee. When life goes up, stay on. When life dips low, stay on. God is with you, so stay on. Stay on. Number two, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Now the stay on's external. Hold on's internal. Stay on's on the outside. Don't keep, keep your feet inside the car. Hold on is inside. Something happens when people ride a roller coaster at Cedar Point that I've observed. They put their hands up and they scream if they're going to enjoy themselves. But I've seen some people scared to death right covering their eyes can't make a sound they are scared out of their ever-loving minds I've seen some people in life who are so scared they're missing what God has for them best part of the roller coaster in my opinion watching what's going on around you one reason I like the raptor there is a final turn in the raptor. Final turn, it feels like you are parallel with the ground. It goes here, one loop here, and then move one more like this. And it feels like you're like right with the ground. So I, I, for whatever reason, I love that last turn right there. I love seeing what's happening. Boy, it's a rush. 
Now, my brother flies airplanes. I'm pushing for a ride in a jet airplane. I think I'd like that rush, too. And if I throw up in there, I don't care. All right? I'll tell you I throw up. That's all right if I get ride in a jet airplane. In fact, I asked my brother once. And my brother is a flight instructor now for the Navy. And he teaches, you know, these uh, the young Navy pilots how to fly in formation and maneuvers. I said, how many guys throw up? He says, every single, bu- every single buddy, everyone throws up. He goes, you get used to it. So I'll probably, I'll probably lose my, my cookies there, too. I'm okay with that. But you feel those G-force at the end. Boy, keep your eyes open. Can I say this, my friend? In life, keep the faith. Keep your eyes wide open because God is at work. Don't miss what God is doing. Hold on here. Defeat the doubts. Defeat to those who would rise up. Defeat the fear. Open your eyes. Second Thessalonians 3.3 3 says this. But the Lord is faithful. Who shall establish you and keep you from evil? Boy, I love this thought that God is faithful. It's a question I missed in a Bible class at college. It was a book of 1 Corinthians, and chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians says, God is faithful. On the quiz, it said, who is faithful? And man, as a young Bible student there, I thought of every character mentioned in 1 Corinthians. I could not think, who's faithful? The obvious answer being, God is faithful. And since that day, I'm not forgetting that, that God is faithful. But you know, we forget it in life. We forget in life, and you can laugh at me for forgetting on a quiz, but you for and I forget in life sometimes God is still faithful. Open your eyes and watch Him work. Hold on now. There are four guys. Decided to go mountain climbing one weekend. In the middle of the climb, one man slipped off a cliff. Fell about 60 feet, and as he laid on that little ledge down there, the other, the other three hoping to rescue him, asked him, Joe, are you okay? I'm alive, but I, I think I broke both my arms. Well, hold on, Joe. We're going to toss you down a rope. Just lie still. So they tossed down a rope. And they said, hold on to that rope. So, okay. And begin to pull him up. About three quarters of the way up, they had a thought. They suddenly remembered that he said he had broken both his, his arms. As they're pulling, they said, Joe, if you broke your arms, how are you holding on? With my teeth. What a terrible ending. <laughs> but sometimes it may feel like both your arms are broken. But God is faithful. God is faithful. Hold on. God's doing something. Hold on. When life seems like a roller coaster, hold on. And last is this. Hang on. Hang on. Why hang on? This is patience. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. Hang on, because God's doing something amazing. God is doing something bigger than we can ever see. God's not forgotten you. God's not missed you. God's still working in a marvelous, magnificent way. God's not dead. In 1923, a group of America's most successful financial men met at the Edgewater Beach Hotel in Chicago. Among them were Charles Schwab, then the president of the largest steel company in America. Samuel Insull, the president of America's greatest utility company. Richard Whitney, he was the president of the New York City Stock Exchange. Albert Fall, a member of the cabinet of the president of the United States. And Jesse Livermore, who was a Wall Street financier. And Ivan Kruger, the head of the world's largest monopoly. These men seemed to have it all. These men seemed to have life under control. If you'd asked these men how life was going, they would have said, listen, we're on the top of the roller coaster. Everything is going well. Look at my business. Look at my steel business. Look, I work for the president. Look, I work in New York City. That's not how life ended up for them. Life took a turn. In fact, there was, a, there was a newspaper man who wrote an article 25 years later. And he talked about this meeting. And he put down what these men, where these men had ended up. At that time, they're top of the world, but Charles Schwab, the president of the largest independent steel company in America, when he finished his life, lived on borrowed money and ended up being bankrupt in life. 
Samuel Insel, the president of the greatest utility company, died penniless, a fugitive from justice. Richard Whitney, the president of the New York Stock Exchange, recently, uh, when the article was written, released from Sing Sing Prison. Albert Fall, member of the president's cabinet, had been pardoned from prison so he could die at home. You see, instead of learning how to handle life God's way, life had handled them. God has a supernatural way of knowing when we need an up or a down. He knows the curves that are coming. He knows the straightaway. God allows things, both good and bad, to come our way. God says it rains on the just and the unjust, but you and I can rest assured in this fact that through it all, God is in control. Sometimes life is a roller coaster. Forget sometimes. I'll put it this way. It seems like always a roller coaster. Up and down, left and right. 2020 has been a roller coaster. And my friend, God is still in control. My friend, God is still working. My friend, God can still cause what you do to prosper. God can still reach people with the gospel. God can still build his church. God can still flourish your family and your finances through your faithfulness. Joseph, in spite of a roller coaster, remained faithful. Didn't try to desperately stop the roller coaster. Didn't needlessly walk in fear. But he waited patiently for the dazzling finish. We'll find out like we know what a finish that was. You on a roller coaster? You still faithful? You defeated in your mind? You hanging on? Be faithful to God. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for Joseph and his example to us. There's times that life seems like a roller coaster, Lord. Lord, we need you. Lord, up and down and back and forth and left and right. We're tempted to think you're not there. You've forgotten about us. We're tempted to step off this ride. Lord, help us to remain faithful. I wonder with your heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, would say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. Pastor, I know what you mean. Sometimes life feels like a roller coaster. Maybe right now you're in the roller coaster part of life. Maybe you're tempted to throw in the towel. Tempted to step off the ride. I encourage you, my friend. God is faithful. He's still in control. I would say, Pastor, as you spoke, God spoke to me. Would you pray for me that I'd respond the right way? Pastor, as you spoke this morning, God was speaking to me. Would you pray for me that I'd respond the right way? Would you lift your hand up? And I'll pray for you. Amen. 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 So, Pastor, my life seems like upside down right now. I'm in that last turn. Wow. I'm looking for a dazzling finish, but I don't see it yet. When you pray for those, will you pray for me? I didn't raise my hand before, but I'll raise it now. God spoke to me this morning. Would you pray for me when you pray for me? In just a moment. And I wonder if you're here this morning. I wonder if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. I wonder if you have the assurance that if you died today, if you'd go to heaven. Bible says that we can know for sure that we can go to heaven. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I wonder if you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I've never trusted Jesus as my Savior. I'd like to know about that, though. Well, would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I'll draw no more attention to you than I did anyone else. I'd love to pray for you. We'd love to open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure from the Scripture that God loves you and Jesus died for you. I'd love to pray for you, though. Who'd say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? And just slip your hand up and slip back down. We'll see it. And I'll pray for you when I pray for the others. Maybe you're with us online. You've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. My friend, in just a moment, they'll put a number on the screen. And we have folks standing by that can answer that. We'd love to open the Bible over the phone and tell you how you can know for sure. Lord, bless this time of invitation. Lord, help those who have indicated by raising hand that they've been touched by your spirit, that they'd respond to you, that you strengthen their hearts. 
Lord, encourage them. And Lord, I pray that there's someone here who's never trusted you as their Savior or online as well, that they would, Lord, come forward this morning or call us so we can open the Bible and show them how they can know for sure. Lord, we love you. Bless the invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand to our feet, heads bowed and eyes closed, if the Lord's touched your heart, you come now and pray. If you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, we'd love to open a Bible and show you. Just slip to the front. We'll have someone meet you down front. We'll show you from God's word. If you're online, call us now. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness. Lord, may our hearts be turned towards you. Lord, as life, and you allow things in our life that brings maybe circumstances that we don't understand or even appreciate. Lord, may we rest and trust in you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.